Good day, and welcome to today's Charles and Colvard webcast as a part of the Planet Microcap Showcase. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to your host, President and CEO Don O'Connell and CFO Clint Pete of Charles and Colvard. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, again, this is Don O'Connell, President and CEO of Charles and Colvard. I'm joined here with my uh, Chief Financial Officer, Clint Pete. Uh, as a formality, we're going to move to slide two. And uh, Clint's going to go ahead and, and dial in our forward-looking statements. Thank you, Don. Good afternoon, everyone. I appreciate you joining us today. Uh, this slide is a lot of words, but it's, it's our standard forward-looking statements related to our future and projections that may be presented in the presentation. Also, you'll see here all our um, forward-looking statements are subject to the risk and uncertainties. Um, which you can see listed here. You can read at your leisure or go to our Form 10-K and subsequent filings uh, to get a briefing on all the risk factors. With that, I'll turn it back over to Don. Thanks, Clint. We're going to go to slide three. So first, I'd like to just uh, talk a little bit about Charles and Colbert, CTHR, for those of you not familiar with our company. Uh, we are publicly traded uh, under the symbol CTHR. We've been established since 1995, a little over 25 years. Uh, we are a fine jewelry company, a globally recognized fine jewelry company. What we specialize in ethically made products, uh, most notably lab created gemstones, and we take those gemstones and we mount them into fine jewelry. Uh, for the most part, recycled and responsible metals uh, in 14 karat, 18 karat, and platinum. We're currently trading right now in a range between $2.90 to $3.22 over the past five days as of April 19, 2021. Uh, over the last six months, uh, it's really important to note that we've increased our stock price over 240%. We're very proud of that. We're very proud of uh, what we've accomplished there. Current market cap is uh, teetering up and down, plus or minus the 87 million mark. Uh, what we can talk about today, we're here to talk about the uh, last quarter, which we published. Uh, it was the highest revenue uh, in the history of the company, in the 25-year history, uh, we delivered uh, an EPS of $0.09 cents per diluted share, which represented a 200% increase over the last uh, year. So we're very, very proud of the fact that we were able to bolster $16.9 million in cash. That is a 26% increase over the prior year, and we believe that we were positioned really well and poised well to tackle the holiday season, uh, even uh, in the current environment and the environment of COVID during the time. Uh, we were able to launch Cadia Lab Grown Diamond brand, uh, which those of you who are familiar with Charles and Colbard, uh, we're predominantly uh, noted for our moissanite and our moissanite gemstones, which we'll get into our products uh, in a little bit. But we did launch Cadia Lab Grown Diamonds, and uh, we believe that is an incredible time for us to uh, kind of uh, offer that choice to the consumer right now, um, you know, in the marketplace. We shipped a record number of packaging uh, as well and packages during that quarter, and we were able to decrease our overall expenses by 21%. Uh, and further along in the slide, I'll just talk about some of those decreases that we were able to realize and recognize between operational expenses, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but for right now, most importantly, let's talk about our products. So I spoke before about our Forever One Moissanite by Charles and Colbard. That is really the pinnacle and the premium product that we offer here at Charles and Colbard. That's essentially our claim to fame for um, basically almost 25 years of our existence. Um, with our Forever One, it is the best of breed. It is uh, considered the world's most brilliant gem. Uh, some like to call us as the white stone alternative. Uh, we're just as hard as a diamond, just a little bit below on the Mo scale. Uh, certainly our diamonds to market are the best of breed. Uh, we bring those to market in the premium grades. DEF and GHI color grades. Uh, if you're familiar with the GIA standards, uh, internally flawless and VVS1 is really where we are uh, with our quality of our Forever One Moissanite. Uh, we do have another brand of Moissanite, which those that don't make our premium brand fall into, and you'll recognize that in a lot of our sales channels as Moissanite by Charles and Colbert. That is our secondary brand, also high quality, but it just doesn't meet that high elevation of that premium brand. Again, all delivered in 14 karat, 18 karat, and platinum jewelry. We say mostly recycled just because of the fact of COVID hit the, um, you know, 
hit the world and then uh, a certain amount of recycled material wasn't um, available. So uh, we're certainly responsible all the way through, but uh, we last reportedly was about 95% recycled materials. So that messaging of the ESG, environmental, sustainable, that is basically the um, kind of the mission and what we're about here at Charles and Cobard, inclusive from our metals as well as our gemstones. We're going to go ahead and move to the next slide here, and we're going to talk about the latest uh, product launch that we had here. So this is uh, Cadia Lab Grown Diamonds. Cadia is also in the premium grades and the premium category. What we try to do with our product brands is delineate the two. So Moissanite is best known for the higher total weights and the value proposition. In the diamond category, we came forward with E, F, and G color grades, also the very uh, premium quality of VS1 or better. So that's who Charles and Colvard is. That's what we're building our brand about, and that's what we believe our brand equity uh, is about, is about quality, price, and value. So the lab-grown diamonds predominantly right now in our first phase to launch. Uh, we launched that with the bridal and fine jewelry. We since, um, you know, since launch between the tail end of Q1, we had learnings and we learned that that consumer was also uh, willing to look for uh, more in the fashion category, which we believe that now uh, we're able to offer that consumer. Whereas a single-threaded product that we had before of only bringing moissanite forward, uh, the smaller accent stones was cost prohibitive to bring uh, pretty much the retail price forward that could command the retail uh, and talk through moissanite. So the diamonds gives us a whole other element. Uh, in Q2, we started realizing some of the revenue associated with this new product launch, but it's fairly new for us. And uh, look for the continuing quarters to come to be able to um, listen and view what strategic initiatives and directions we're going with the product. So fundamentally, uh, we believe this is a great accent to our products. We believe that it actually is additive and accentuates our brand. It also opens up Charles and Colbert to uh, tap into what is already known to be a $5.2 billion market and a $5.2 billion market opportunity. There's uh, a huge amount of uh, talk and hype and uh, we are now in the conversation because of lab-grown diamonds. So uh, we also believe that we are the only uh, play from a publicly traded company uh, into the lab-grown diamond space at this time. So we believe we're poised and positioned right. Um, also, what I can talk about is that lab-grown diamonds has now brought us into the conversation, whereas we perhaps were not fully in the conversation uh, over the prior years just on the moissanite. So what this, done, what this did for us was enabled us to get uh, FaceTime between the Forbes magazine, um, Brides.com, Refinery29s of the world that actually are now reporting, uh, you know, Charles and Colbard uh, pretty much on a regular basis and talking about the things we're doing and the initiatives we're doing. And what that's doing for us and what we recognized in this last quarter was it actually elevated our moissanite uh, awareness campaigns and positioning. So great opportunity for us uh, moving forward, as well as um, it also uh, will lift the moissanite business too as well. Uh, moving forward, I put together a slide for you. Uh, my team did a great job here. This is a great illustration. So if I draw your eyes to the left of the screen, you can see Forever One moissanite. You can look at the center of the, of the column and you can see half carat, one carat, one and a half, two carat, and 11 carats up. So if you continue your eyes to the left, look at the price range, $899 for a half a carat. But as you start to get to that two carat range, look at the value proposition on the moissanite. It's $2,100 range between a two carat moissanite. And if I draw your attention to the right, Arcadia Lab Grown Diamonds is $13,299 for the equivalent of a two carat. So two completely different customers it really is the preference and the choice of that consumer that we now offer. Now, if you were talking about, you know, a, a naturally mined diamond, let's talk about that. So a two-carat naturally mined diamond will run anywhere from eighteen dollars to $22,000 for a two-carat equivalent to what we offer. So that would be eighteen dollars to $22,000. To your right, a two-carat of $13,000, and all the way to your left in a moistenite 2100 
Now, the commodity is there, so we're mounting this in 14 karat, 18 karat, and platinum jewelry. So it's, you know, it carries the commodity and the intrinsic value of that item. If you look at an 11 karat moist night all the way up to the center of your screen, you can really see the difference on a moissanite stone is $11,500 for one of our premium exotics. So those are the two product brands. Those are the two price points. That's where we live and breathe each day and the products that we're bringing to market. If we move to the next slide, we're going to go to slide seven. We're going to talk a little bit about our signature collection. So this is really important to the brand. It's really important to the company. Now, our signature collection is very unique to us. It delineates the brand, and it delineates the kind of styling and that red thread that we were trying to find when we came to market. So it's almost like a Yerman-esque type of, you know, kind of theme running throughout our signature collection. What's most notable here is we do not discount anything related to signature or signature jewelry. This is maxim, you know, maximum margins, and we, we're able to, um, to really start to penetrate the market with our own delineation between our brand and who the competition is. Uh, if you look down below, I don't want to go through each one of these, but look at each element, get an understanding of what we're about. It kind of walks you through kind of the mission. Uh, really most important here is to cut the color, the clarity, and the conscious, and that's our four C's up at our floret. If you look all the way up at the top portion of the presentation, you could see our floret, that's our logo. And if you look right below that, look at our ring, and that signature is right there as well. So uh, we'd be more than happy to take calls on it to talk a little bit about our mission and why we believe, uh, you know, we're a great company for, um, for the future to be able to invest in. And we're continuously looking for these type of elements to delineate us from the others. Let's talk about our sales and distribution uh, channels on slide eight. So our business is broken up into two segments. We have our online segment, and we have our traditional segment. I'd like to start a little bit to the right here, and not all the way to the right, but just look at our traditional segment. In our traditional segment, our brick and mortar uh, partners are there, and then we have our wholesale partners. Now, the wholesale partners are really important because those are our distribution partners. What they do for us is they move loose gemstones, and then we basically move those gemstones through distributors who then – uh, sell those into independent retailers who then use Charles and Colbard Forever One, Moise and I buy Charles and Colbard into their own jewelry and help lift the overall brand. Our brick and mortar stores carry uh, our exclusive jewelry from us, not gemstones. Well, actually, we do sell gemstones into our brick and mortar partners too, as well. Uh, most notably, Hellsberg Diamond Stores. You can find uh, Forever One, Charles and Colbard. Uh, in almost six foot of showcases in a lot of the stores and then four foot of showcases in all the other doors outside of their outlets. So this is the foundation of the business, and this is primarily where the business was over the course of the years and the evolution. What has shifted and changed was our strategic direction to our online segments. So in our online segments, we have our owned properties. These are properties that we control. We own them. They're our own proprietary website, charlesandcolbart.com. And then we have our moissaniteoutlet.com. So charlesandcolbarta.com is what we call the premium, the prize, the gift. And uh, basically it represents uh, the largest portion of growth for our company. Our online segments represented 62% of our overall sales revenue. And our traditional was um, the balance of that. As well as the online uh, owned properties, we distribute our products through different marketplaces and drop ship partners. If you draw your attention over to the right side of the screen, you can kind of take a look at this sphere of all of our uh, sales channels as well as our marketing uh, channels as well. But if you look in the middle, since we're referring to sales, right at the top, which is charlesandcobar.com and then Moist Night Outlet, and then we go to our marketplaces here, which is Amazon's, Walmart's, Ebay's of the world, uh, and then we go... Uh, into uh, right here, which is our e-commerce sites between the Hudson Bays, the Belks, the Overstocks of the world, the Boscovs, the Coles, the Macy's, Hellsbergs, et cetera. So really, really nice penetration between the channels. Uh, we're very well diversified, which allows us to have a really nice, strong blended margin. Uh, so the margin for this quarter 
uh, was 49%. Certainly direct to consumer, you realize and recognize higher margins in that category. Um, to draw your attention to the bottom of the screen, on the left, you see distribution and order fulfillment. We certainly have the best of breed infrastructure. Uh, we believe that we're sized and, and scaled properly. Uh, we have a really nice network. Um, just a little aside as it relates to myself, prior to coming uh, here at Charles and Colvard, uh, I was with a company, a Berkshire Hathaway company called the Richline Group, very large multi-billion dollar distribution and fulfillment jewelry company. Uh, certainly took that knowledge and transferred that knowledge into our operational side. So we're really solid there. We've got lean and centralized um, capabilities there. Uh, and then the marketing strategy uh, is, is really important to me and important to the organization. So on the marketing side of the equation, we've adopted a, uh, a peso model, which is paid, earned, shared, and owned media. Certainly on the paid front, it's really important to note that those are keywords, ad words. Prior to uh, the last couple of quarters, uh, we basically uh, did a lot of top of funnel prospecting, which we still do. The only difference is we earn that exposure. We earn that awareness, both between earned and shared. Um, marketing strategies and methodologies. The paid is the paid. We move mid to lower funnel, uh, conversion-based, and of course, anything that we can own to control our own destiny is really important. I'm gonna move to the next slide, which I'm just gonna show you some, some quick hits. I'm not gonna go into all the details. Uh, on this slide, I will though, some key important critical factors here for Q2 to note, to why we believe we're really in a good place right now. 12.1 million in revenue, as we said before, highest in the history of the business. Um, you know, really, really important, 49% gross margin, 16.9 million in cash. Our inventory levels, we really feel we're in a good place. Um, we have no debt outside of the PPP loan and normal operational liabilities related to the business. We believe that that PPP loan for $1 million, a little less than a million will be forgiven. A net income of two and a half million, nine cents per diluted share. Um, that profit represented a 209% increase over Q2 FY20. We had an EPS of increase of 200% despite what we're going through. So we do have a line of credit. The line of credit we have not utilized or accessed, really important to note there. For the sake of time, I will kind of go through this. You'll have these slides available to you. Again, uh, just take a look at the net sales, look at the increases, and look where we're at uh, across the board. Uh, and look at, most importantly, the online uh, channel segment grew 25% uh, from 6.1 to 7.6. Again, we spoke a little bit, uh, moving to side of slide 11, kind of the income and the earnings, 209% net income, the diluted share up 200%. And of course, uh, you know, you're welcome to kind of look through this as well and ask continuing questions. Uh, we're gonna move to slide 12, some really important notable factors here decreased uh, operating expenses by 21%, sales and marketing by 22%, G&A by 19%. So we were able to do all of this during the peak and the height of the season coming off Q1 and Q2. Some important ingredients here to really kind of uh, mix up is to, to understand, I have been uh, with the company for five years, four of those years as the chief operating officer. The last two quarters of reporting I have been the chief executive officer of the business, and that is my role here. So if you're modeling the business and you want to get a better understanding of the business, it's important to note that uh, uh, we effectively changed the business uh, just coming out of the end of Q4 into Q1 by sizing the business by 25% and, and making some really strategic decisions uh, to kind of grow the business and uh, responsibly um, you know, take charge of the business to stabilize into the COVID effect uh, or during the COVID effect and come out the other side in a really, really good place. So uh, let's talk about some of those strategic initiatives uh, focused on discipline growth and those growth opportunities uh, really kind of changed the whole methodology of the marketing strategy. We spoke about mid to lower funnels. We expanded our product brands. So the goal here, Charles and Colbard, is the premium, the pinnacle, the brand, the house brand, and then the product brands Forever One and Cadia that we bring to market. We're going to increase customer engagement, which we have already had. Take a look at kind of our Instagram, our Facebook feeds. You'll see that we're moving more into video 
into digital, uh, all the while now we've expanded our customer demographics. So our demos uh, in the prior, we kind of shifted uh, more into a millennial push, which is great, but there's a huge amount of boomers out there that are uh, looking for that value, price, and quality that we offer here at Charles and Copart. So um, I'm going to try to open up whatever I can for any questions to kind of see if we've got any questions, um, you know, which is really important. Uh, but sure, okay. So I'll talk about the digital commerce a little bit more now. So the goal here as it relates to the digital commerce side of the business is that we focus ourselves into being everywhere that consumer is. And right now that consumer is driving more toward digital commerce connected uh, capabilities to be able to convert that customer. So those are the things that we're doing that we can drive all of this group and these customer demographics. So stay tuned for that. I really can't talk much about that um, now. Certainly uh, we've just booked our fiscal Q3. So those of you who want to, um, you know, kind of model us or get a better understanding of where the company is going and where we're growing, uh, certainly the, um, we will make an announcement tomorrow. Uh, can we talk about that now? So, so May 6th is it, I believe? Correct. So our, our earnings will be on May 6th, uh, coming up here shortly. So we look forward to kind of delivering those earnings. We look forward to doing more presentations. Uh, we want to thank um, Planet Micro for uh, allowing us this venue to be able to, you know, uh, everyone who's kind of met with me in this forum and talked to me and spoke to me uh, knows that I'm, I'm cognizant of the investor community. We want to continually drive shareholder value. We want to continuously drive growth so that we can keep driving that multiple of uh, 2x, 3x, and 4x and continue to deliver uh, what we've delivered in the past couple of quarters with the new kind of strategy and the new organization. So if there's no other questions, um, okay, I do have a question on, okay. So one of the questions was any plans uh, regarding rental jewelry? So that's a great uh, conversation right now. Certainly, uh, the Signet Group just made a capital investment in that category. Um, so, uh, you know, I believe that they probably would have market share with that. We did try some uh, rental partners and rental programs. It's certainly open for discussion, but at this time, currently, we don't um, have that. Uh, with the recent launch of Moissanite Outlet diluting the brand? Great question. We do not believe so. Uh, Moissanite Outlet is uh, designed to be a uh, disposition strategy at the lower top of the lower, lower point of the funnel. And with that being said, it doesn't say or, or fly the uh, Charles and Colbert brand or flag. Uh, it's merely a mechanism, you know, that I've uh, learned to understand and grow to solve for a lot of companies in my prior capacity inventory and the use of inventory and it, the obsolescent inventory was always a problem. So we kind of uh, created that and uh, we're seeing that that's going to be a, uh, also, um, you know, a catalyst to be able to hedge off any uh, competitive and lower end moissanite. But uh, we don't believe that's going to cannibalize anything. So our return policy is 60 day uh, return of policy. Um, question was, what is our return policy? We have a 60 day money back uh, guarantee on all of our jewelry. We have a lifetime uh, replacement on our gemstone uh, forever one, as far as that con that's concerned. And certainly we have, um, you know, policies to protect the consumer. And we're very customer centric. I mean, that's really, really the, uh, really the focus of what we have. Uh, is there any reasons why margins would decline in the future? So we're not seeing that. Uh, we believe that the margins are pretty consistent. We believe that the blend and mix of our uh, product mix is great, and uh, we're able to have enough direct-to-consumer where we maximize kind of that retail value, and uh, we feel that's a really, really good, and, and it would continue. Uh, the competitive landscape for lab-grown jewelry. So certainly we believe that those who had to make capital investments in the lab-grown space have a disadvantage to where we are. We believe we built a destination for lab-grown and lab-grown moissanite, so that's why we were able to get the market and our path to market so quick, and we believe we're positioned well. Um, as a, you know, from a supply chain and supply chain issue, we believe we're in a really, really good place. 
on both fronts with both product brands. And uh, certainly the three and a half decades in the jewelry industry, we believe we have that going. Um, so as it relates to uh, how is Macy's doing for you, so certainly, uh, you know, I'm not at liberty to discuss, you know, the next quarterly results. Uh, we basically launched Macy's the tail end of Q1 into Q2, and we'll look to having more dialogues related to that. So another great question uh, was, would we anticipate any revenue related to the inventory write-off? Uh, certainly, you know, I can't comment on that uh, explicitly, but I will tell you that Moissanite Outlet is created uh, for that value consumer, for that opportunistic buyer that doesn't want the level of premium grade or premium quality of Charles and Colbert um, uh, Forever One offers on the Moissanite side. So we'll be there to capture that market. I do believe that as a company, we lost a tremendous amount of market share in the low end market, and we will look to capitalize on, on that right down and kind of move goods, you know, as we deem necessary throughout that channel. Interesting question. Do we see an opportunity to start raising the price on moissanite as it becomes more accepted as a diamond alternative? Great question. Um, we believe that on the signature side of the equation, our forever one is encrusted in those pieces, and we do maximize high premium prices on those, and we're able to, you know, command those retails. I think we're in a good spot related to the moissanite, but certainly a good question. Uh, but, you know, stay tuned for that. But I, I believe we're in a good place on pricing and our methodology with that. So where do we source our Acadia material from? So, you know, certainly unlike our Forever One silicon carbide, which is exclusive to Cree with the exception of a carve-out, and we pretty much have that locked up for the next five years, uh, certainly um, the diamond world has adopted, and it is the movement of, of um, kind of the future state of jewelry. So with that being said, uh, there's not a supply constraint for us at this time, and we feel very, very comfortable. So we feel that uh, we're in a good place. So with that, we're running out of time. Certainly you can call our um, IR at charlesandcolbar.com or log into our uh, email and be able to kind of reach out to us, and we're very flexible and open and transparent to be able to have open dialogue should you uh, need to answer further questions. Okay, with that, I have to turn it over to uh, Kelly and Keith. And we thank you for joining us. Thank you. This does conclude today's webcast. Thank you for your participation and have a wonderful day.